Magnus. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what do you all think? Should we um, give people a little bit more time? Um, or should we start? I'm fine doing <laughs> I'm fine doing whatever you all think is best. I just I want to make sure that anyone who was trying to join, you know, is able to, that they get the new link. Um, but I also want to be respectful of the people who have joined so that they don't feel anxious, you know, while we await starting. So I'll follow your lead. A few more minutes. Okay, three more minutes. So if anyone who's here, if you need to make a quick potty break, check your phone, you know, reapply makeup, <laughs> whatever, um, we'll give you just a couple of minutes about, um, so we'll start in a few minutes. And um, thank you for your introductions and then also sharing some of the things that you all would like to know, because we definitely do want this to be an interactive session. There, um, there is a, a few slides and just some information that we're gonna give about Sincerely Your Autistic Child, as well as a few of you will be able to win a couple free copies if you'd like. And then, and you know, of course, um, we have um, Dr. Anthony and Kirsten to, you know, um, and myself to and, um, answer questions and, um, then um, we hope to kind of start a dialogue about supporting our kids, supporting our youth. Hi. Hi, Erica, welcome. Thank you for having us. Oh, I've been asked to speak. Ooh. You may regret that. <laughs> And so um, just so that you will know, there are some people who are posing some questions. So for example, if there's one um, that's in the q and I'm asking about Wake County. And so if anyone might be in that general area and have any information, feel free to you know, type answers and provide resources um, to one another if, if there's something that you um, are what, familiar with. What was the Wake County question? Um, it was uh, about parent support groups for teens. Okay, I'm, I'm a parent of an autistic teenager in Wake County, but sadly, um, I'm not aware of support groups. I know Teach in Chapel Hill out of UNC uh, might be one good resource to start with. And then um, also there's a local autism society chapter to look into. I am one of the autism uh, resource specialists for the autism society. I work in the Charlotte area. And we also have autism resource specialists in Wake County in the Raleigh area. Um, part of our jar, job, I'm sorry, is to connect parents with resources. So you could reach out to them. If you go to the Autism Society of North Carolina website, you can find them. Um, I can give you their names and all that, but it would be probably just easier if you'd go to that website. And I can put the website in the chat right now. So do we, I wasn't sure which one of us was going to do the whole hi, welcome and intro and housekeeping stuff. Go for or it. what would it be like super autistic to just get straight to the point and skip you know, the I actually prefer talk? that. Yeah, that's why yeah. I was just going to offer. So sometimes people like that stuff, but okay. So we're going to skip it. I'm going to share my screen with y'all. I don't think I have any um, sound on this, but just in case, like click sound. And 
hopefully you all can see my screen. Yes. Awesome. Okay, so thank you for being here um, at the parent guardian session. Glad to have you here um, and I'm very happy to be able to talk with you all. I'm going to share a few things about um, Sincerely Your Autistic Child, um, which is an edited collection written by autistic adults who are sharing information with parents, um, providers, and the community in general about things that um, they've experienced and learned and in a hope of giving guidance and support to others. It was published by um, Beacon Press, who's been around for over a decade, um, over, uh, well, definitely over a decade, but over a century. They are, um, you know, they publish a lot of social justice books and um, AWN Network, which stands for Autistic Women and Non-Binary Network, um, is what, you know, is the originator of the, the this concept and the book. Um, I've been volunteering with them for a number of years and I do consulting with them um, in addition to some of my other roles, such as my role as a humanity scholar at Rice and some other things. Um, my name is Lorena Kay and I am an autistic adult. Um, I also have ADHD and a bunch of other letters. <laughs> like, uh, but um, in, in any way, um, in my day job, I'm a professor. Um, I come from a nonprofit background and also do a great deal of advocacy. Um, I, my greatest role, you know, I guess to me, the role that I'm most proud of with everything is, um, is that of a mom. I love my kids. They are everything to me. And, um, you know, and so hence, um, I know that your kids must, I'm assuming your kids are important to you too, and that's why you're here. Um, I'll be very quick, because again, I want to make sure that we have adequate time to talk. Um, my pronouns are, are she, her, hers, and they, them, theirs. You can use either, both interchangeable. Um, I like to start off presentations with what I call the five C's of accessibility. I'll just do them really, really quickly. Um, one stands for comfort, because you are able to engage better, listen more, et cetera, when you are comfortable. So, you know, be comfortable. So I've got some dragon fruit vitamin water. I got a fan next to me, got some cookies that are supposedly low carb according to the hubby, stimming devices and all kinds of stuff here with me. And, um, and I'm sitting in a place that's comfortable for me. I want you all to be comfortable too. So if that means communicating in the chat, which I see a few of you are doing, which is great. Um, if it means posing Q and A, um, please let us know how we can support and help you. We want you to be comfortable. Um, and then so the next C stands for um, communicate. So communicate with one another. Let's make this interactive. Um, we want to be respectful, you know, of one another, but we also want to share what we, what we know. Um, next C is for consider. Um, and so I sometimes uh, interchange between like consider, collaborate. That's why there's two C's here. I kind of debated if I need to make it six C's, but I like the five. But um, I want to be considerate. I want everyone to be considerate. So we're all different. No one has the same experiences. Um, and some of us, you know, you know, have a certain knowledge base, others have a different one. Um, so in terms of the way that people communicate, so if someone is using certain pronouns, let's be respectful of those. If someone prefers to be referred to as a person with autism, please refer to them as such and don't call them an autistic person. Conversely, if they prefer to be called an autistic person, please be respectful of that. Let's not police one another's language, but be respectful of how people identify. Um, similarly, if someone is having any kind of challenges or issues with the audio or with, you know, text to speech or anything, let's, you know, or, or finding language or wording, let's just make sure that we give one another grace and, you know, let's have, you know, give one another the benefit of the doubt. Um, and my last two C's are for challenge and commit. Um, I add challenge because I think that a lot of people, you know, they, you go to a lot of webinars, you go to a lot of sessions, you have your own life experience, your own educational experience, professional experience. Um, you know, sometimes people can feel like, okay, is there anything more to know? Well, yes, there always is. In the, in the classroom of life, there's always something new to learn. And if it's something that you've heard before, um, that reinforcement in some way can be um, important too in terms of retention. So I just ask you to challenge yourself today that something about this session, take it away for to benefit you, to benefit your kids, to benefit you know, your community at large, your neighbors, your colleagues, um, it takes something away today. And then I want you to remain committed. We're all doing different things. So it gets annoying when people say something like, oh, we're all a little bit autistic. No, we're not. <laughs> no, some of us are, some of us not. Now, are we all neurodiverse? Like the keynote? Yes, absolutely. There's this, 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 neurodiversity is a fact of life. 
two people who are neurotypical have very different brains from one another. And we all know that, you know, there are, if you have, you know, neurodivergent and or autistic children, the likelihood that you are neurodivergent is quite high. You might not be autistic, but you might have some, some stuff going on and that's okay. That's who you are. That's the diversity of, of humanity. And so whatever your role is, you know, stay in that lane and do it well. If you're an educator, be the best educator that you can be in and be empowered in your role. If you're a parent, there's nothing to be ashamed of. Be a really freaking good parent and, you know, be a good model for other parents. Encourage others. If you're an ally, if you're an autistic person, you know, trying to become comfortable in your own skin. If you wear multiple hats, which many people do. Whatever it is that you do, it's needed. Um, sometimes people will say stuff like, oh, I don't do anything like you. I don't do um, public speaking and all that. And I'm thinking, and that's not your role. You have no idea how many people you might be touching through mentoring or through, um, you know, education, through counseling, through art. No, nope, you don't have to be a person that wants their face and their name out there. You make your mark your own way because we need it in this society. So, e. um, y'all have to forgive me if I seem a little spacey because I like to have captions up, but I also know that it's distracting for some people. So because I'm sharing my screen right now, I have them turned off temporarily until um, later. So if I seem a little off, it's just the trying to process. So you all, if you're able to see the screen, you might be in a situation in our, you know, virtual life that we're living now, where you've got kids jumping all around while you're trying to handle up, handle business and you're trying to take care of this, you're trying to take care of that. Things can be a little chaotic, but you know, that chaos is part of life, right? It's our new normal. And so thank you. If that is your situation, thank you for taking the time to be here um, and to learn and to share and to grow. So I want to talk to you a little bit about Sincerely Your Autistic Child. And so Sincerely Your Autistic Child was published um, and it came out um, at the end of March, 2021, but its predecessor was a book that is called, actually, I don't think I should have this up. I don't want it in your faces. I um, hope it hasn't been up the whole time, but if it has, sorry. Um, was a book that is called What Every Autistic Girl Wishes Her Parents Knew. And so over a decade ago, um, there was an organization that was formed by an autistic person in their bedroom. This person had four neurodivergent children, one of whom was autistic and um, was a single parent and um, in the process of working to get their teen some services and help, um, could have, you know, learned of their own diagnosis, essentially was, was, you know, embracing themselves as an autistic person and could find so very little about people who were assigned female at birth. Um, every, all of the meetup groups were for, you know, you know, people who are assigned male at birth. They were sort of certain types of interests. They were almost like dating, you know, I mean, it was, it was like, if you came, it was like, okay, hey, you want to date, you know, <laughs> any of these people here or whatever, like there was not a whole lot of, no one was talking about certain types of issues. It was hard to find people who had similar experiences. And so, and then parents who had daughters were kind of like, okay, you know, in our, you know, therapy group or whatever, my daughter's one of the only few girls, a whole bunch of guys, or there's a whole lot of resources to my son, what about for my daughter and so on. And so this was a way of kind of giving voice to gender minorities, because, um, you know, it was this organization at the time was called Autism Women's Network. Over the time it has evolved, it's always been an inclusive organization because anyone who knows anything about autism, we're different, you know, and I mean, neurodiverse people in general, but particularly with regard to gender, our experience of gender, our, how, how we call it. So whether we're talking about, you know, gender identity, and then we can layer sexuality, you know, alongside that if you want or not, but regardless of a person may be assigned female at birth, but the way that they interact or engage is different than maybe the other little girls around them or the boys around them. You are just you. And it might not even be that you have any sense of dislike or discomfort with the you know, physical part of your gender, but it just doesn't feel, it just feels like, for me, gender just feels like clothing. Like, so all my life, I didn't know people actually identify, even though they say, act like a man, act like a lady. Those are, people say a lot of things. They say, how are you? Fine. They're not really fine. So growing up, I thought that gender didn't fit anybody. It was just like how you're born, right? And your mom decides, I'm going to name you this. In my case, because of my culture, my grandfather decided <laughs> on the seventh day when I was named that I was going to be named Marina Kay. But regardless, um, they say, I'm going to name you Laurel, or I'm going to name you Hank, or I'm going to name you this. It's a name and you answer to it but it really doesn't belong to you any more than if your name had been Matthew or Taylor. And so you might keep it and you're fine with it. You might change it. And so, you know, I just felt like that's just what gender was. Didn't realize that there was a sense of, I don't know, cohesion that people had with 
with not just their neurology and their circumstances, but with their gender. So um, this book that was written and self-published at the time with an independent um, imprint, Dragon Bee Press, um, uh, many of the people who wrote it afterward had started, where they're thinking, hmm, when, you know, year X, I had considered myself this, and I use these pronouns, but now I view myself in this way, or now I view myself in this way. Um, a number of the people who had, if you'd looked at the, the author um, directory um, or biographies in the first book, nearly everyone identified themselves as a cisgender woman. Um, and now in this one, people might see themselves as, you know, trans or metagender or, you know, all these different things. So, and then also the fact is that in the world that we live in, there's a lot of similarities. There are certain things that impact people who are sexual or gender minorities, but there's also things that impact people in general. And so there's certain advice and information that's helpful for anybody, not just your daughter. And so, um, we basically wanted to make this more expansive and kind of, you know, honor and celebrate um, the gender diversity that exists in the autistic community. Um, but also, you know, not even though, yes, there's a whole lot of things about, you know, little boys or men or what have you, but just make it inclusive in general of parenting, of, of being, you know, of a parent. And so um, the original editors were um, Sharon Davenport. Um, they are an autistic adult. Um, and then um, Emily Page Ballou, who also is, and Christina Thomas. Um, Christina has since um, finished, uh, you know, gotten her PhD and started a consulting business and is doing all this cool stuff and wasn't really available to edit. So I was very happy to be brought on to um, join. And so this book in its, you know, its original form actually won the Temple Grandin Autism Society of America Outstanding Literary Work of the Year. And so um, this is myself, this is Emily, who is originally from the Midwest and lives in New York. This is Sharon, who is um, from Texas and now lives in the Midwest. And there's, in addition to the three of us who are editors of this, this collection, there are a number of people, of authors who contributed to the book, um, um, who, of whom are, all of them are autistic. And then we have two um, non-autistic parents who wrote the forward and the conclusion. And so quickly, because again, I want us to have a little time to talk, I just, I pulled a few of the quotes from the book, and then I just want to, I'm going to read the summary and just talk a little bit about it. And then I'd love to just us talk with one another in general. Um, but basically, um, I know um, there is an autistic person, an amazing um, advocate named Lee, who, along with their child, formed a, a neurodiversity lending library, because every time when their child was diagnosed at, at a young age, when they went to the library to find out things about autism, there were very few books. And the few things that were there were either about like Temple Grandin or they were like, woe is me, um, you know, autism ruins your life. Uh, how can you, despite autism, how can you thrive type of things? And Lee was like, well, this is really disparaging. It's kind of like, and so I want to give an analogy because I mentioned in the, uh, when we were doing the keynote panel, I talked about my best friend who's white, but her parents are immigrants. So my best friend is, an, is like me and I'm an adoptive and a biological parent. So um, my, my friend's daughters are black. And so, you know, you wouldn't want to say, oh, well, I want my child to know all about their black culture. So let me read about slavery and let me read about discrimination and let me read about how they're less than, you know, no, you want things, you want to be informed about disparities, but you also want to be able to affirm positive things about your child and you want neutral things, right? Would you really go to the KKK for information about how to empower your black child to love herself? You would not. <laughs> you would go to the black community and you go to people who are knowledgeable about it. You wouldn't go to people who live near the black community or raise black kids. I mean, you might go to them some, but ultimately you go to black folks. As an adoptive parent, I've um, gained a lot of information from adult adoptees. I don't know what it's like to be adopted. I will never know what it's like. And it doesn't matter. I can adopt a thousand children. It's never going to be my personal experience. So while I have knowledge of some sort that's adjacent, it's not the same. And so similarly, there are so many books and information that's out there by people who work in the, in the, in the field of autism or people who have a, a partner or a child. And that's all great, but that's not you. That's not you. And so you have something to give and share, absolutely, but not in place of the others to amplify what's, what others have. And so we felt like, frankly, a lot of the advice that people are given, that parents are given, is not helpful, it's wrong. Like a lot of parents 
there's, you know, strife sometimes between autistic adults and parents. And again, an autistic adult can be a parent, um, but by between non-autistic, I guess, parents and um, autistic adults. And often I think it's because there's, um, again, people are gaslit into believing you, are get, you get a diagnosis, they tell it to you as if they're breaking the news of, you know, like terminal cancer. And um, you're told that you have to rush and get into things right now. And you're told to second guess everything about yourself and what you think about parenting. And you're made to feel very small and inadequate and frightened. And um, you're not given tools to, when you see things about your child that you think that you like, or you, you think that are positive, you're told, oh no, he's not really communicating. That's just echolalia. Oh no, they're not really bonding. That's just this. And so parents are frightened and sometimes they're just following the, the, what they feel is the best advice that they have been given to try to make things, uh, the world safe for their child. Um, and a lot of times what the world teaches you, we talked about code switching earlier in the, um, you know, today, um, a lot of the reason code switching exists is because of the fact that if some people came in and they spoke the way that they normally speak or dress the way they normally dress, then would you really get that job? You know, there's a reason why certain people, you know, butch up, you know, even though they're, they're not closeted to go, you know, if they're going to an interview, what have you, so they won't, so they'll feel like they have a fighting chance. Um, if you blend in, you mask, you camouflage, you might seem less different and, and therefore safer, even though difference should not be frightening. And so we wanted to, parents to know things that we thought our parents would have cared about. And so quickly, I'm just going to read a couple of things here. Um, so this is what we have on the back of the book. Um, part mem sorry about that. I'll go back. Part memoir, part guide, and part love letter. Sincerely, your autistic child is an indispensable collection that invites parents and allies into the unique and often unheard experiences of autistic children and teens, highlighting how parents can avoid common mistakes and misconceptions and make their child feel truly accepted, valued, and celebrated for who they are. Most resources available come from psychologists, educators, and doctors and offer parents a narrow and technical approach to autism. This rich, diverse, and poignant collection represents an authentic resource written by autistic women and non-binary people themselves. From childhood and education to gender identity and sexuality, contributors tackle the everyday joys and challenges of growing up while candidly addressing the emotional needs, sensitivity, and vibrancy of autistic kids, youth, and young adults. So we have contributors who are Latine, who are white, who are black, who are multiracial, who are Asian and so forth. And so um, here's a couple of quotes that from the book about the, the world has, you know, your child is a value to the world and the world has a place and need for them. Um, when you let go of expectation, your hands are free to embrace your child for who they are, not for the neurotypical person that people want to change them into. Celebration and acceptance of diversity begins in your own home with you. Being called low functioning and dismissed as a lost cause did enormous harm to my self-esteem. Again, these are just quotes from the book. I have become a person that I hope my younger self would be proud to know and perhaps look up to. We draw strength from knowing that we are accepted by the people in our lives. The recognition of our full humanity and chances to be genuinely included in the world around us. And so quickly, cause I wanna make sure that we have time to, to talk. Um, this is the website for AWN, Autistic Women and Non-Binary Network or AWN for short, awnnetwork.org. This is my website, which is Marenna K Geos. It's but like more Nike go, I go away. And then this is the way to reach AWN, info at awnnetwork.org. And this is Samantha's email, who's my assistant, because I need help and support a lot. <laughs> and this is how to reach her. And this is a, on Twitter. This is AWN's handle and mine. AWN also has Instagram, Facebook, um, Tumblr, et cetera. So I want to stop screaming, screaming, share screen sharing, whatever I'm doing. And I want to talk with y'all. Um, about different things. And so um, I like what Noah was mentioning about interdependence and there's so many different things. I'm, I know we have to kind of go through the, the questions, but I just really want to talk. So, and I'm happy, like, again, we're going to, I'm going to do a little exercise before we close 
to give away a couple of the books, um, some e-copies of the book for a couple of people who don't have them. Um, and then I'd be happy to read some things out of it. But really, I want us to talk, like we're all here and not just myself, but also um, Dr. Anthony and, and Pearson, you know, um, and, you know, we, and, you know, all of us here who are on the panel and really um, there's, you know, we learn things together. There's things, you know, you learn certain things on the job while you're learning it. Um, you unlearn certain things as well. But, you know, a lot of society, the message that you're given is, you know, the very first time I went to a parent support group, I've, I've shared a story a lot, is uh, I was so excited because I was like, these are going to be my people. It's, it's like neurotypical parents would look at you like, why is your kid not talking? What's wrong with your kid? Why are you carrying them? They don't, didn't understand. I was like, these are going to be people who understand. It's not going to be a big deal that my child, you know, is wearing pull ups or that my child doesn't talk or needs this or needs that, needs that or whatever. Um, these are going to be my people. They're going to get it. We're going to be able to give each other little tips and pointers, you know, like, you know, super excited, you know, and when I went in there, they were talking about how the diagnosis was like 9-11, like it was like being hit by the tree, you know, and these people were grieving. And I'm thinking, when does grief evolve into something practical? Are you always going to grieve and mourn for the fact that your kid isn't what you thought they'd be when you had no guarantee that's who they'd be anyway? Or are you going to work with what you got? <laughs> and see the beauty in the child that's in front of you. Um, and Jim Sinclair's Don't Mourn For Us is, is very powerful and very beautiful. Um, I used to read it a lot in a lot of my speaking engagements kind of as an icebreaker. Um, if it isn't something that you've read, I encourage you to look it up, um, J-I-M and then Sinclair, S-I-N-C-L-A-I-R. Maybe we can put it in the chat, but Jim Sinclair's Don't Mourn For Us. Um, it was written, uh, it was spoken at, I believe, a meeting either the Autistic um, Society of America or the um, Autism Nas National, I don't remember a and I what stands for, but it was like a meeting, I think in Toronto. And this was basically a way of kind of addressing that whole idea of mourn your child that you didn't have and get over it and all that kind of stuff. And it was like, you know, it was kind of like, okay, we're not the ones you're mourning for because the child you wanted never really existed. This is who we are. Can you get with that? You know what I mean? Because you're going to have to if you're going to raise a happy, well-adjusted child. They need you, you know, and this is not about indictment. I think a lot of times people talk about being attacked or people not understanding their circumstances. And I don't think they realize how many of us are parents, too. Like, I don't think I'd know my neurology if not for my children. We understand parents, and, you know, yes, there's bad parents, but most parents love their kids. But that doesn't mean you know everything about being, uh, you, we, we all have to learn. Um, about and so like anything else in life you have to learn and grow and um, and adapt so that you can be the parent that you need to be thank you so much Jamie and so I definitely encourage you all to read that so I want to I've just been talking 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 um, so I see a couple of things about ABA um, and other forms of therapy um, some questions from Linnell and I really just want to um to chat with y'all. If you all, you know, are here, you know, that we've got a panel with, you know, awesome people here who know a lot. And then we have you all here who are awesome people too. And um, let's talk. <laughs> the link is not working for you. Hmm. Um. Does anyone, I don't know how much, I want y'all to talk to y'all, it's kind of quiet. I'm wondering, would it be, if everybody's different, would it be beneficial to anyone if I was to read it to you all, or would you all prefer to just read it on your own? I can put another link for it in the chat though. Um, oh, three books were most helpful, okay. Um, here's another one. Oh wait, that's the same one you used. Why is it not working for you all? Um, read on your own, okay. Um, Neural tribes, yeah. So there was a, uh, I don't. There's a website called Not an Autism Mom, um, and this um, there was a book club called the Aus Awesome Book Club. Um, not an Autism Mom has a. If you go to that website, notanautismmom.com, there's a list of over a hundred different books about neurodiversity, uh, books for children, books for adults, books for teens. There's some books in Spanish and English, and they're really really great books. And um, um, I think that they, they are a lot of things that we hope would be helpful and encouraging for um, people to, to take a look at and to kind of understand autism, maybe from our experience. Everyone talks about it like it's such this bad thing that destroys your life. And so I'm, I'm just going to be honest. I'm just going to be real with y'all. Okay, so as you can see, I'm Black. 
kind of obvious. Um, <laughs> and so I think about like my life, my culture, my, my ethnicity you know, as a person whose family is from West Africa, I'm raised here in America, raising you know children and so forth. Are there elements of being black that suck? Hell yes. I don't like being followed around the store. I don't like, um, you know what I mean? The fact that my parents had to have the talk with me and that I had to have the talk with my boys um, and I'm probably gonna have to have them with my grandchildren. I don't like um, some of the microaggressions and things that happen, they freaking suck. But then there's certain things that I just absolutely love about my culture, the resilience and the vibrancy and the creativity and the richness. So it's like, you know, or I could say the same thing about my gender as being a non-binary woman, you know, like, there's elements, and I could say, a, what, regardless of your race, you know, women in the room, there's some things about being a woman that's kind of crappy. Like, you know, a lot of people may not have to be concerned about when they're walking to their car late at night through a parking lot, but we do, or about what you're wearing, the length of your skirt or whatever, you know, all these different things, these rules to life that some people don't have to um, deal with. It might make your life more challenging, but just because it provide, adds some challenge because of circumstances, you know, in, in, inherently in and of itself, it's not necessarily a challenge. Doesn't mean that it is a bad thing. Like there are also some amazing things about being who you are. And so it's like you take, you, you, you're supposed to, you know, celebrate the strengths, work on the work and accept, accept and work on the weaknesses and live out the neutral. But that's not what's happening when people talk about neurodiversity. It's in the worst possible ways. How can I get this autistic kid to fit this? How can, instead of how can the world be designed in a way, how can work be designed in a way? How can people be more this? Um, it's always us having to adjust to the, a world that's very, very triggering, very, very inaccessible, very, very, um, you know, unaccepting um, to us. And so um, really, you know, I just, you know, I feel like there's so much here we're talking about college and um, the career and like in supporting these kids to grow. And so I just really want us to kind of spend some time and talk about what's real, you know, like this is like the anxiety and the depression and so forth and the coursework. Um, and I think there's so much that um, I think we can learn from one another. Like it's, and that is one of the reasons why we wanted to write this book as parents there's some things that some of y'all are doing that are great and you need to give yourself more credit and you need to lean into that because your child is thriving and, and surviving because you're a safe haven for them. And then there's some things that you're doing that are not great, that might be causing them a complex, that might be adding to their anxiety, that might be um, causing them to you know, feel um, you know, unwanted or broken or like they need to, to shift or hide or change. You know, it's, we, we don't know, but you know your child that you raised that child. I can't tell you the names of any of your children. If I say, oh, there's Amy, Erica, Nancy, I don't know the names of any of your children. I don't know their favorite color. I don't know their favorite type of mu music, their favorite food. You do. You may not share your child's neurology, but you know your baby. But you have never been your baby. We have. So I may not know your child, but I've been a child similar to your child. And so have us. So basically together, your personal knowledge of your child and the knowledge of you know uh, others who of that neurology and the experience and what works often and what doesn't work and what hurts and what doesn't hurt and be able to you know and what not to do and what not to say the pitfalls that can be avoided if you have that um, information the the you know trauma that can be prevented in your child if you have that information you know so it is. Um, and I said, you're not like my child is one of the worst, most disrespectful things that we hear. And we hear it all the time. And, and I want to say something about that because about how, and people are like, I don't understand what I'm saying. What's disrespectful about it? I mean, my kid doesn't talk. You got a, a you know, a, a graduate degree, you work this and the other. And so what they, first of all, I like to say that I don't know what any of y'all do in your, your regular life, but I don't know what you do behind closed doors and neither do you about me. And so people, you know, you, someone can look, you can look at someone like, um, who, one of the authors in this book, Amy Sequencia, who was oh, told, sorry, who was told that. Uh, hey, Tyvin, how's it going? Can I interrupt briefly? Yeah. This is not super important. Hi. Hey, hey Jana, uh, you're not on mute. Could you mute, Jana? Now that Donna's office is closed. Okay. Um, sorry, I think I muted her. Lisa. I hope I did. Um, sorry, Marna. Okay. No, no, it's okay. And so, um, so Amy Sequencia was told, people said to her parents, oh, Amy's 
low functioning. She has severe autism. She'll never this, she'll never that. They would talk about her in the room like she wasn't even there. Amy didn't have the ability to, you know, type at the time to communicate. Amy, um, you know, had was very had a great deal of receptive understanding. Amy was reading um, on a very advanced level, had a lot of energy, but Amy was having a lot of issues with motor planning and with you know seizure activity and with anxiety. And so uh, for many many years, Amy was just thrown into this place, like brought around like a piece of furniture, spoken about by people like she wasn't there or like she didn't understand. Um, and and for years, you know, her parents loved her, but they believed what they were told. And so they lost a lot of years, <laughs> um, not realizing how brilliant she was and how she was stagnating in these bad environments. Um, and so all these people who say, you don't know what's inside your child. You really don't know what anyone, you know, like no one knows what's inside any other human being. Similarly, the person that looks totally put together to you, you don't know if they're not, they're self-harming at home. You don't know about their level of of anxiety, um, the amount of support that they need, the executive functioning that they have. You don't know, because if, if anybody knows how to fake the funk and survive, it's autistic people. <laughs> we know how to do it. So we fool ourselves sometimes. So, you know, believe me, just because, you know, we get up on a stage and speak at the United Nations or the White House doesn't mean that we're not having a panic attack in the car because we have to go to open house for a child or because we have to answer the door for the Uber Eats delivery person or, because we've lost our debit card for the 18th time in six months or whatever, or you didn't remember to eat or bathe, you know, it's just it's so many things um, that you, you can't know what anyone's child is like. Thank you. If you call me low functioning, you're seeing me for my needs and not my strengths. If you call me high functioning, this is from Magnus, um, you see me for my strengths and not my needs. And neither label respects that my needs and strengths change throughout the day. Um, and so you know, instead of looking at where people are different, you know, I, I would like to, you know, again, give another example from the black community. Um, someone could be Haitian, someone could be from the Dominican Republic, someone could be from Ethiopia, someone could be from Kenya, someone could be from the Bronx. Their cultures are all different, but there's still some similarity. This one might speak French and this one might speak Arabic and this might speak English, but there's different, there's, there's totally absolutely differences, but there's also similarities. Similarly, no person, no autistic person or neurotypical person or other person is, is the same as anyone. We're all individuals, but there's still enough, there's enough similarity where there's something that can be gleaned from our words and our life experiences um, that can potentially be of benefit instead of people discounting that. So, um, and that's why this is again, like so important, like just sharing the thoughts and perspectives of what works, what doesn't work, what to do. And, um, you know, we would love to kind of talk about some of those things together. So I see that there's a couple of questions here. I see one from Linnell about AB, uh, other forms of therapy that are good for teens. And then I also see Bethany was mentioning that suspecting um, autism this summer, my daughter is not interested in the label and she's already, that's very interesting. All right. so. Um, I find, so my mother is not formally diagnosed, but she's so autistic. Sometimes people, I think a lot of us, we, you know, and particularly those of us who are late diagnosed, we, um, we go into, we might self-accommodate already. So maybe you already kind of hang with the people who are a little kind of quirky or weird. Maybe you, you know, bring things, you know, I always used to have headphones on, you know, so that I wouldn't have to, not noise canceling headphones, but music, even though I wasn't really listening to music, but if people thought you were listening to music or carry a book, they'll leave you alone. That was my way of kind of dealing with, so arrive late, so you don't have to deal with, you know, the small talk or whatever. Like, so sometimes people, you know, and especially I think that we find that um, in like the, you know, the arts, um, in certain types of science, you know, like um, te technical field sciences, there's a lot of different areas. A person can have different areas of interest. And sometimes some of these non-traditional careers or, or, or interests or paths are places where we thrive. And if a person feels very comfortable and is getting what they need, um, they, so I, I, everything in life is a label. I mean, like we live on the planet earth, that's a label. So um, I think that, so that your daughter not necessarily wanting a diagnosis right now, she might not need one, but I think that a lot of things, a lot of people say stuff like, oh, my kid was fine until this, until this. And I wanted to think about, well, what happened at that time frame? Your child was fine all through, you know, pre-K and everything. And then they went to school. What happened? Because I know that for a lot of us, that burnout, that, you know, happens when we no longer have the capacity to continue to do what we were doing before. Circumstances changed in some type of way. Things have ratcheted up in life. 
to where now, maybe it's our hormones, maybe it's our circumstances, maybe it's the environment, maybe it's a combination of things to where we might've been able to function. That doesn't mean we're doing okay, but now we, we are visibly, you know, struggling. And so it might be beneficial, you know, for her at some point to have the diagnosis. She, she doesn't have to have a formal diagnosis to know who she is. Um, it can be beneficial. It can also be harmful. There's a lot of difficulty. There's a lot of um, problems with, you know, the, with discrimination when you are, you know, a, a disabled parent. Um, the child welfare system, you know, is not your friend. So there's some things that are really, that can be very harmful. Um, sometimes if the label isn't always helpful, um, unfortunately. Um, and so some people were talking about therapies. Um, we, there, are, you know, for everybody's different. I, so I think the best therapy, first of all, is just being accepted, living life. But that doesn't mean you still don't need stuff. You know, for example, you know, like, so, um, like I, you know, have a child with a heart condition and yes, I absolutely accept and love him. I also make sure he takes his pills, right? <laughs> Cause I need him to live. So there's the practical and there's the theoretical. And so I think a person having a safe space and some kind of understanding and accommodation of, of their life, you know, and, um, and, and sense of some type of, um, autonomy and quality of life is important but everyone's different. So for some people, it's therapy. Some people, my children did do therapies. We did occupational therapy. My kids actually loved that. We did speech therapy. We did a lot of it in like the natural environment where it comes to home, where they take you to the park. We used a lot of, I think that people don't, um, they discount how helpful technology can be, can use. I think everyone speaking or not speaking should look into some of the supportive technologies that are out there, the augmentative assistive communication devices, AAC, how helpful it can be. Um, having, yeah, I love that, yes, self-care, um, things of that nature. Um, I don't know if we have enough time on this panel to talk about um, ABA. I understand that a lot of people have limited options um, and there's a lot of things that insurance won't pay for and that it's what you're told to do, right? You get that 100-day kit and they tell you to put your kid in there, hit hard, hit early. But there's, you know, there's never a one-size-fits-all approach and anything that's trying, that's compliance-based and that doesn't really consider the client's desires and needs um, isn't going to be something that's, you know, really going to, you might gain skills, um, but at what cost? I mean, we learned a whole lot about the human body from the horrible things that were done to humans during the Holocaust. We learned a whole lot about hypothermia and this and the other, but at what cost? Just because something's effective. Slavery was very effective as an economical system. Doesn't mean that it's, um, it's ethical. And so, um, I um, just want to give you all some time to talk. So I, I saw a parent, Kathy, with two older kids who are graduates. Can you tell me if your kids went to Wake County? If so, what schools would you recommend? I have a nine-year-old and struggling to find a good school. So please definitely share that if you're able to um, with um, Anne and um, see if there's any additional questions. Um, a lot There's been a lot of talk from a lot of autistic people about ABA therapy and how um, it has caused them, you know, a lot of anxiety and PTSD. Um, I'm just, I'm going to say something that a lot of people don't say, because I believe in being real because I came, you know, so when I, when my daughter was diagnosed, um, and they, you know, put the, the fear of God in you about all this mess, and the other child's going to, life is going to be destroyed. That child that you're looking at right now, going to bang their head every moment of the day, smear feces on every wall, everywhere, and every building they ever see, um, drown in every body of water, even if it's the size of a, you know, I don't know, a thumbnail. Um, they're going to, um, you know, absolutely die and be destroyed if you don't do this right now. Hit hard, hit early, early, early. That's the only way to make them indistinguishable from the norm. So I did put my child in an ABA program. Um, that's, I didn't know any better. So I know a lot of people don't admit, but I am. And I regret it to this day. Um, fortunately for me, it was an eclectic program. It wasn't even like a pure ABA. It did involve some natural environmental teaching and technology. And it was almost kind of set up more like a developmental situation. But there are still aspects of it in terms of when you take people whose brain is already really, um, you know, concrete, and we're already perfectionists, and we're already really um, sensitive about things, and there can be some really gratifying things about it, the repetition, and there can be some things that cause a great deal of anxiety. Um, but when you live your life, and you're so different, you're already second guessing yourself to teach someone that they have little autonomy, that they need to change and adapt for everyone else, that they need to say the right thing, not what they really think or do this, or, you know, you're training someone, you're grooming them for possible abuse. If the rates of, of abuse in autistic people are astronomical. 
Um, I don't know a single autistic adult that has not been um, physically or sexually assaulted. I don't know one single one. I'm just saying, I know people along, around the globe. So um, I, resources for college students that will move on and internships and experiences. Okay, so yeah, so let's talk a little bit about that some. Let's talk about the, um, so first, I guess I wanna ask if, I don't know if, if it's okay to, maybe there's a raise hand feature, a show of hands. Um, if you are, if any of you, I know some of you have students who are in higher ed right now. Okay, so I see a few hands. Okay, I see some more hands coming up. Uh, I should probably raise my hand too. And so I think that, so let's talk because I know that some people, we know accommodations vary from place to place <laughs> um, in terms of quality. We know that for me, when I went to college, again, I didn't have my diagnosis, but college was not the problem. The problem was all the unwritten stuff. Like high school is regimented. You go here, you do this, you do this, you do that. If you don't, if you're late, there's an automated call to your parents, or if you don't turn in this homework, they get an email or whatever. You know, college, nobody cares. You can completely fall through the cracks and nobody knows anything. So the uh, managing my time, knowing whether or not I go to the dining hall or do I lose track of time and now I haven't eaten or um, keeping up with things and the socialization and just all of those different things just the, about life, those things that, have, that are beyond what happens in the classroom, you know, um, setting. And then even how to communicate with, your, with um, you know, instructors in, in a way that's not rude. Um, there are certain things, you know, like what are some things that you've found that have helped? You know, cause I know that like I'm thinking about the students that I teach, I work in a two-year college setting and it kind of naturally is a place where a lot of my students thrive because of the fact that it builds in multimodal learning from the beginning. If you're in robotics or if you're in, you know, whatever, some of these fields, you're automatically doing a lot of having a lot of lab time. You're involved in a lot of, you know, things where you are able to experience your learning. It's not only didactic, you know, lectures and what have you. So some of these settings are really good settings for people who learn differently. Um, and and they can see the practicality of it a lot of the time too. Um, but the things about life, the making eye contact and you know regulating your voice a certain way and answering questions the way they want you, the game um, that society makes you wanna play, that's not something that you really just learn. It's not intrins intrinsic to us. So and can, can yes, I please, please. share something? Absolutely. Um, my son was lucky enough to be involved in a program in TEACH called T-STEPS. And they worked with him very hard on a lot of that executive functioning piece, um, trying to organize your time, help them, help the, the kids that were part of that program learn kind of to chart out their time so that they made sure they had enough time for studying, they were prepared for tests, just did a lot of work with um, my son about that. And once he got to college, he was able to pull out all of the information that he got through teeth T-steps and put it to work. And it's been a huge lifesaver for him, you know, as far as the executive functioning piece, it's been very helpful. I wish I had something like that when I was young. <laughs> I only picked up some of those skills late in life. And I think that contributed a lot to my professional success. And, and just like being able to use modern technology, being able to use like every, every teenager today has a smartphone, right? And every smartphone has a reminders app of some kind, calendar app, timers, just being able to use those things um, to structure my day and make sure I'm doing what I need to do and I'm where I need to be when I need to be there. Uh, just like finding some way to build those skills could be great for any autistic student going into that unstructured college life and, and, and even from college to their, you know, adult life and their professional careers. Well, and I want to add something too. Um, with my son, he has kind of, he has a really hard time reading very quickly, um, being able to get through all the reading. But in college, he was able to make use of some technology that actually started out of supports for people who are visually impaired and totally blind. Um, he gets a Kurzweil reader version of all of his textbooks so he can read them and get through them, get through all that reading. It, that also has just been a lifesaver for him, you know, to be able to get the information down before he even goes to class. 
That is so important. I, I, I wanted to, so we use a text-to-speech, text-to-voice program um, at my um, college called Read Speaker. I know there's tons of other different ones. I know there's, you know, some web-based ones and what have you. And so we, we encourage, we pay for it for all students, all faculty and all staff to have access. And we talk to them about the fact that it's, are you multitasking? Are you washing dishes? Could you listen to something? Could you, you know, like, it, it really takes, I agree with you. Like, I think there's a lot of, there's things that, are beneficial to people overall that people don't want to look in because no one wants to look like they need help. But we all need help. We're all interdependent. And so I think that there are a lot of, there's a lot of re really good research about the benefits of some of these types of, um, you know, learning tools. And, you know, and, you know, some of them are available for free. Some of them have a, a cost involved. But um, I, I thank you for mentioning that because I think that that's absolutely, you know, a, a tool that's very helpful for a lot of people. Well, and I just think about my son and, and the, the families and the children that I met through my son. Know other families who have children on the spectrum, and how if some of them had had access to this in middle school, high school, maybe they would be in college today. Um, you know, it, it's just a shame that you know that things are not uh, provided more equitably. And and like I said, this comes out of work. You know, if, if you were visually impaired or totally blind, you could have uh, the Kurzweil reader access. And so I saw there was a, um, someone mentioned, made a remark about, so I saw a few additional hands, they made a remark about their child, a program that had been really helpful. Oh, thank you for the self-determination resource. This is awesome. Um, I want to find, so I could kind of emphasize what the person was saying, the various different internships and the university. So I know sometimes they're, um, because I, I think that it's variable. So sometimes I think that what's available at a university is not always apparent. Sometimes there are, you know, I hate to say this, but a lot of like, you know, um, support services and disability services are have the worst websites sometimes, <laughs> you know, like, because it may not even be disability services, it might be like, there might be a, um, like a learning resource center, or there might be a, you know, a place to offer services for like first generation, you know, college students or for non traditional students. And sometimes there's a lot of really good resources, but you can't really, it's not always very apparent. Um, so sometimes it takes a little bit of investigating. Um, you know, for that, but um, there are also things in the in the greater community um, that could be beneficial for people that you know, uh, with independent living centers and um, other you know other areas. And then there's some like web resources that are really great as well. Um, in terms of the um, um, the, I guess it all depends. Like we're talking about um, internships and job opportunities, and there's been some really good research about how. People are starting to really look at the benefits um, and not that we want to quantify because the value of a person is not about what they can earn or what they can do, but there are certain characteristics that are often found in neurodiverse um, students and you know, individuals that, are, that can be really um, advantageous for employers. Um, you know, we tend to, you know, when we can maintain a job, we tend to stay longer, you know, be loyal. We tend to be able to, um, you know, engage in a lot of like creative, you know, problem solving, um, tend to have, you know, fairly good, um, you know, like, you know, in terms of like attendance records. I mean, it, it doesn't mean that we won't have help, need help or support. Obviously, people might need to telecommute, people may need changes, but um, there's actually, you know, it used to be this thing where, people felt like it was a some type of charity <laughs> um, or, you know, to help outside, help these people. And then they began to see how much return on investment that you obtain. Um, and so Marianne, I'm, I'm very sorry to hear that uh, about middle school and high school. Um, um, there are, and I think that's, that's a, a struggle, you know, that I think a lot of people have is that, um, you know, as someone with a special education um, degree myself, uh, my graduate degree from special education, um, there people will have, there's a certain type of like integration and um, collaboration and things that you'll see um, at the, you know, at the primary school level that often does not um, carry over to secondary. Um, and it's, you know, it's very disheartening because people should be empowered, you know, like learning, you know, the whole world is a classroom. Like, and I love Bill Hook's um, philosophy of learning and engaged, uh, you know, pedagogy in terms of 
uh, being excited about learning and being our, you know, kind of humans being our own scientists. And it's not about necessarily any particular subject, but just about the benefit of being able to, to of, of knowing and learning and gaining, um, you know, information. And so um, it's so important to be involved um, and to, you might have to be that parent sometimes. Like I, I can't, I have, you know, had a lot of, we, we have some, a great relationship now, like, and, you know, this, I'm happy with my children's education now, but we had a lot of, a lot, a lot, a lot of, of, of turmoil. You know, there were a lot of things that I had to speak up on and I had to ask for, and you have to know what you're, you know, what you're entitled to and know that they will um, lowball you. Um, they will, you you know, if your child seems to be quote unquote, okay, um, they will let them, you know, not ad provide adequate support. Or if your child seems to be, you know, struggling in a particular way, they may have lower expectations than they need to have, than they should have. Um, you want to be respectful of these people, but you want them to, to, you want there to be a team effort. You want to be involved with your IEPs. You want to um, know what's going on, you know, find out about transition services, start early. Often it's, you know, by the time the schools might start sending a couple of brochures home, it's too late. Find out what's available through the, um, if it's the workforce commission or what have you in your area. Um, th um, there is a lot of misconceptions that only if you, you know, that people only qualify for X services in, you know, if there's intellectual disability. There are certain things that yes, with, you know, with intellectual disability, I, I, my oldest son has intellectual disability and he's non-autistic. There are certain things that are earmarked for people with that disability, but there are also things that are for people with, you know, disabilities in general or various types that can help with support um, in terms of, you know, employability and gaining knowledge. Um, so I just encourage you to look into some of those. There's a lot more vocational rehab and a lot of other services that people may potentially qualify for, and your children may not need your income, you know, as, you know, if they're considered, you know, emancipated adults, they may not need to report your income. Um, they might be able to use their own. Um, so we have a little, we have about 13 more minutes. I um, really want to, you know, this to be a session that's beneficial for you all. Um, if um, Dr. Pearson, um, you know, and, um, you know, Dr. Anthony, if there's anything that you, you wanted to share with the, you know, like resources or ideas or thoughts that would be really helpful for parents, you know, as they, um, like, I know one thing that helped me a lot, like I could, um, I could get a job. Well, like, you know, a lot of autistic people talk about, you know, some people can get a job, they just can't keep the job. So like, you know, like I would come in, I was always like this, like a comet. I could come in like bright shining star, but I'd burn out, you know? And so there were times where circumstances happened, you know, I could do the job, I could do the job great, but it was all the other stuff outside the job, the schmoozing and the networking and all that stuff that I didn't understand is where I'd get myself in, in, in problems, in trouble. And um, my, um, my parents let me come back and live with them and they didn't make me feel shamed and, and ridiculous and silly for doing so. You know, like they didn't make me seem like there's something wrong with me. They just, they joked about, hey, good. Now you can kind of help run errands and stuff like that. Like, you know, they um, didn't make, you know, to where I didn't feel because the pressure of feeling like you're not meeting societal standards, the social clock of, you know, earning this amount or doing this or doing that or achieving this way, it really does weigh on a person's psyche. So sometimes just the way you word things, you know, be real with your kid, but also be encouraging because it is difficult. You know, my um, mental health was very, very much affected by a lot of the things that I was dealing with. And so, you know, the being that you all are in, you know, um, higher education and you're in, um, you know, and just kind of work with this population, you probably have some wonderful insight that you could offer to parents and love for you to address them. Thank you so much, Marina Kay, and thank you everyone for such an engaging discussion. I was just going to add one brief thing. I believe it was Nancy maybe who shared information about the T-STEP program, and for others who might be interested, they are um, bringing on new students this spring, so I did share the link in our chat earlier, so if you're interested and you have um, an autistic young adult or adolescent who might be interested in that, um, definitely take a look. And then tomorrow, Dr. Anthony and I are going to be doing the parent uh, uh, panel and discussion, and we're going to talk more specifically about some of the local programming, um, and we'll uh, engage in a bit more discussion around some of the programs that we are offering here around Raleigh and in Fayetteville.
Yes, and thank you so much again, Morena K, for sharing your insight and experience as a mom of two awesomely autistic young men, Elijah and Gabriel. I appreciate you just being able to articulate how you navigate this world as, as I'm trying to help them um, and see things from their lens. And as um, Dr. Pearson pointed out, we're going to have we're going to further this discussion tomorrow. And I'm so excited to welcome everyone, um, you know, when we come back tomorrow. So can I just want to jump in with just a couple things really quickly? So parents, um, I know there's conventional wisdom about what's acceptable, what's not, but I just I just want to share a few things. Please don't care about what the world says about um gaming and whatnot yeah, if your child wants to game for hours you you know it may sound ridiculous i know people are like they need to get out of the basement and they need to go do something and yes yeah we probably do you know but at the same time you don't know what purpose that thing is serving i can't tell you how many times i played music over and over or watched things over and over just to kind of to um to you know to kind of um, fight off suicidal ideation to reduce my stress to make myself to gear myself up and psych myself up for having to go do a whole week or a whole day or of smiling and peopling and acting like this and that and whatever, you know, some of those things, who gives a freak? Like, you know, all this stuff about, oh, this person's sharing this, their kid got into this college and they're this and they're that, all this living vicariously through your children and bragging, be, be proud of your child, what they do, what they, you know, there's things that your child is capable of that no one else is. And there's things that they might need time to do. The developmental timetable varies. I'm grown. I still love watching some anime. I love, I love watching Disney movies. I'm a big freaking kid. Yet I still love, but, I, but give me some peer reviewed articles and I'll be, th I'll, you know, I can throw down with that too. Like, you know, it's like the, you know, so if you like, you like what you like, even if it's unconventional, um, that's not something to, you want to, you know, help the child shy away from. So if your child's really, really, really into something, you know, sometimes people are trying to introduce their child to any, to something, anything else. No, lean into that thing that they like. You can build so much conversation from that. Maybe you can find some kind of group of friends that like that kind of thing. Maybe it will build into something that are similar to that, um, you know, that, that are similar, that'll help them take risks in, in life. It's just so amazing. Um, online, you know, like you want to talk to them about the reality though. And thank you, Kathy, for mentioning that. Yes, there's so many online friends. Um, my, my autistic daughter, um, I wouldn't say I, she doesn't have any in-person friends. Now she is not mistreated or bullied, but she's just, it's overwhelming for her, the idea of talking and socializing. So her classmates like her, but she can't deal with beyond just doing work or, you know, she can't deal with the, with all of that, <laughs> you know? So lunchtime is when she sneaks away to read or, you know, goes, you know, she needs that to get away. Um, but, um, you know, online friends are real friends. It's not any less than if someone's not going to prom or not doing this. Sometimes it's because they they aren't don't feel comfortable or they don't feel welcome. But sometimes it's because they really just don't want to, and they're okay. Um, Amy, please ask your question. I don't know if you were going to type it or if you were going to share it, but you're welcome to. Um, and also don't be worried about their friends are very different. Like if, they, if they've got friends that are older or younger, you know, obviously within reason, you want to be safe. You don't want, you know, perpetrators, you know, harming your child. Yes, Amy, yes. Um, I saw that you had a question. Oh, you're not sure how to unmute. Uh, hmm. <laughs> and, um, and so, but, you know, so I'm, I'm not sure can one of y'all help her because I have no idea how to, or I don't even know if you were, what your pronouns are, Amy. Does someone help Amy? But, um, you know, people might like, you know, like if I just think about the people that I know in the autistic community all over the world, there's people who are grandparents and there's people who are, you know, college age. There's people who, I guess, technically, if I was a young mom, I'd be old enough to be their mom. <laughs> and like, these are people that I feel such a connection with. Like, so um, friendship doesn't, and I don't need a whole lot. A few really good friends to me is better than a room full of fickle ones. Um, Amy, um, I see that you're unmuted, I think. So um, please feel free to ask your question. Uh, thank you so much. Um, this is just so inspiring and so helpful. I just, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Um, so much of this is resonating with me and my son is a big gamer. He spends a lot of time alone. He's been very isolated since COVID. Um, 
and he's in a private school because virtual school was not working in the public schools um, here in Wake County. And um, now he is being required to take a physics class, which is completely over his head. He makes A's and B's and everything, but he's failing physics. And I can't seem to get around that requirement for him to graduate. Um, and I do not want him to switch to a whole different school. So I'm wondering if anybody has any suggestions for how to advocate for him and, and get that requirement waived. Um, Amy, he has, um, is there a way um, that he um, could possibly take it through another provider, like an external, like, you know, being that I know that he's in private school, but like that he could transfer it in as a course that he takes on his own, like um, through correspondence or virtual means, or is it just that, or are you trying to see if they'll um, approve another science altogether so that it doesn't take his GPA? Yeah, um, gosh, and at this point, I don't care about his GPA as much as I care about him just graduating yes, high school. and just being done, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so, you know, virtual would not work for him because he does have a nonverbal learning disability, ADHD, okay. not, he has a really hard time getting motivated. One of the reasons we went to a, a private school is it was smaller and yes. the classes, you know, the teachers really enjoy him in all their classes. They talk about how intelligent he is, but he's really struggling socially and um, he feels really overwhelmed in this one physics class. And they, you know, I, I think I mentioned earlier that he is very intelligent and I think um, he hates the term high functioning because he said, I, yes, I, I, I hate that just too. expect me <laughs> yeah. to do the, all these amazing things, but I don't have the, the ability to handle the stress around it. Yes. And that's what they, and people don't realize they erase, you know, the fact that people still very much have needs. And you know, my daughter, the same thing, my kids are in private um, because of the fact that I fought back and forth with the schools. They feel like if your child has got a certain IQ level, they don't have needs when they still very much have pragmatic or social or whatever needs. And then, um, you know, and it's very frustrating how a lot of people don't understand, um, you know what I mean, about the, you know, the, the, the fact that, you um, he might be in a, he's in a good environment, but certain things, the con concepts of the way certain courses work um, can take, can be, are, are, are difficult sometimes for a person to kind of, you know, and then there's the self-fulfilling prophecy of once you're starting to feel, you know, anxious or overwhelmed. And so I'm, I'm really hoping that, um, where are you located, Amy? Because I know that the presentation okay. tomorrow, they plan to give some local and kind of state resources. I'm hoping that there might be something that you can do in terms of um, asking for permission to substitute a course for a different science or? Yeah, um, he's in Raleigh or we, we're in Raleigh and he actually is part of the academic support program, but I'm, I'm kind of miffed about how little his academic support person really seems to understand. She was even saying in his um, plan that he needed to make eye contact in order to show that he's listening. And I'm like, what? <laughs> so I immediately responded to that and I said, he will not do that. And he's, it's not that he's not paying attention. He just is uncomfortable with that. That is not something that he could do. So if we're able to get him the diagnosis of um, autism, you know, next week during the evaluation, I'm going to have them lay it all out for them and let them know, you know, you cannot expect him to do what a neurotypical um, student will do. And he, he really is picking up on a lot of it, even if he's not seeming like he's paying attention. He wouldn't is be making A's and A's if he weren't paying attention. <laughs> is he in a private school or public school? Um, private school. We moved him um, from a public school to a private school. See, and that the hard thing about that is with private schools, they actually don't have to honor any special education sort of anything because they are not getting any public money. Right. But they do. They, um, they, I feel like they've been a little more responsive even than Wake County because, um, you know, it's a, it's a smaller school and they do, you know, I had to pay a lot more for the academic support program, but I don't know how, how much they really understand, you know, because he was identified as having nonverbal learning and ADHD, but not being on the spectrum yet. But I think that's definitely. Oh, yeah. That's always like the trifecta. <laughs> yeah, ADHD, exactly. NBL, the, um, you know, um, all these are like these things that we get on the, on the route to. <laughs> yes. Yes. It's like whack-a-mole kind of thing. Yeah. Um, Amy, so yeah. just pu putting, Go ahead. I, I, I'm sorry, just putting all options on the table. This is Magnus. I, I'm not only autistic, but I'm the parent of an autistic teenager in Raleigh. Okay. And when we were considering uh, her education options, the way we went was homeschooling. 
homeschooling in North Carolina has very, very low requirements for what you have to do. And um, now that she's at the high school level, she's actually pretty much a full-time student at Wake Tech at this point. Mm -hmm. And is able to take, um, you know, high school and, and, and pre-college level classes at Wake Tech. So th there may be other options for you. Yeah, the private school route, um, I don't, I don't know if they necessarily have to provide or adhere to any kind of IEP. And one other thing that um, worked well for Legally, me in science. Okay. One other thing that worked well for me in science. Now, granted, like I, I'm, I'm, I'm like close to 50 now. So this might not be an avenue available today. Um, I had an independent study science on my IEP. Well, yes. And, and we actually requested that, um, but they said, okay. does it no work around, but I think I'm going to keep on pushing because this is his senior year in high school and we can't let him okay. fail high school because of this one stupid class. Well, you, I never if he's doing great and everything else, <laughs> you, you might be able to just make him a homeschool student and, you know, enroll him in Wake Tech for the things that, that he enjoys. And um, that should be no barrier to getting into college. We are, we got another um, daughter who was homeschooled her whole life and she's now pre-med at UNC Chapel Hill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's so, actually uh, so discouraged by school in general that he doesn't even want to go to college. And so we've put that, we've taken that off the table for now and said, let's just get through this year and then we'll, you know, we can figure it out from there. But yeah, I, I never did consider homeschool homeschooling because he is an only child and I just, I wanted him to have more um, interaction with other people. But now that I'm realizing he's, on the spectrum, maybe I should have yeah. done that. Well, so, well, and, and at his age, like I said, home homeschooling can mean sending him to Wake Tech. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and it I guess like that you've was been very responsive to his needs, Amy. Like you know, putting him in a smaller school, advocating for him. I I keep pushing for the the substitution of the independent study science, um, you know, or again, you know, like the Wake Tech. Um, homeschooling has been an option that, that um, some people that um, I really know and respect have done too. Um, and um, and I think that it's definitely an option that works, you know, went for, you know, for some kids, I, I do understand you saying that he's an only child and he probably does enjoy, you know, being in a smaller, the smaller school setting that he's in, but um, mm -hmm. yes, don't shut up yourself. That's right, Kathy. Keep on advocating yeah. <laughs> for your son. And, and also that he doesn't even want to go to college. That's fine. <laughs> School college. And I, yeah. <laughs> you know, oh, we don't yeah. have expectations. We, we want you to be happy. That's the main thing. We're just struggling with the depression and anxiety that he's feeling right now. And so we're trying to take everything off his plate that we can. Um, still having expectations because we know he's capable, but not putting too much pressure on him to be like everybody else, you know. And I see the other Amy was trying to unmute and I do know we're a little over time and I know that Thanks. I want you all to be able to get to the, um, you know, I know there's the, the job there, I think are, are coming on now, but we, um, so we did, I did want to make sure if you have a chance, Amy, um, to unmute and share your thought. Or were you unmuted already? I think she may have been on two devices. Oh, okay, I see. So, so it was happening. Oh, sorry for the confusion. Maybe, maybe I'll. Yes, left. no, it's okay. Because one had your last name and one just had Amy. Okay. Oh, yeah. Thank you all so much. <laughs> but I appreciate it. Sure. Well, thank you, everyone. I know we've got, we're a little over time. Um, I will, I think I'll just um, find a way. Maybe I'm sure there's a list of everyone who attended and we'll just kind of randomly draw a few of you and, um, or a different Amy, okay. Um, to, um, and what we'll need to do, we'll, you'll receive a link. Um, it'll be through G Play for you to get a, um, an e copy of the um, Sincerely Your Autistic Child. And I'm not sure how, if we should, I guess we, we're going to go ahead and wrap up and just stop now so that you all can get to the other things. Um, please also attend tomorrow. There's some great resources that you'll get, and we appreciate you being here. And thank you, Marina Kay, for leading such an awesome discussion this afternoon. We really appreciate you. Thank you.